Hello and welcome back to Object Oriented Programming with Python. This is part 21 and we're going to talk about something that's very common in the programming world and that is we often are called to look at a system say it's the temperature of your fish tank and determine whether or not we need to turn the heater on because the temperature is too cold. And as we discussed before, that leads to a thing called hysteresis where the temperature will go from being too warm to being too cold and it just keeps going back and forth because the heater is only being told on or off. Very, very common. So let's talk about PID, which medical professionals among us will say, oh, that's pelvic inflammatory disease. But it's not. Not in the computer programming world. In the computer programming world, PID is proportional integral and derivative. And here's a real fancy block diagram for those of us that love those block diagrams. But what you want to see there is that we're going to take three calculations. We're going to add them up. And that error calculation is then going to be fed back or returned in the loop. And we're going to do this theoretically forever. So PID is the summation of errors. And it was originally um, designed to, uh, to basically for autopilots. Um, so the PID controller takes two inputs and produces one output. Now what are those two inputs? Well, it takes a set point. So let's say that I want my fish tank to be at 76 degrees Fahrenheit. And it takes <coughs> a continuous or semi-continuous measurement from the system. Essentially, whenever the system needs a measurement, the measurement will be there for it. Okay. Then it has an output, and the output is going to be a number between 0 and 100%. That's going to be given to the output device, so that instead of just turning the heater on and off, we're going to turn it at some particular percentage, maybe 32% or something. The controller calculates and sums three errors, and then it raises or lowers the output, so that we are striving continuously to make that error equal to zero. In other words, we wanted the temperature of the fish tank to be 76 degrees, and darn it, we want it to be 76 degrees. Not 77, not 76.5, not 75.5, we want 76. There are three errors. They're classified as proportional. How far is the system from the set point right now? Let's say that I don't know, power goes out for 24 hours. And the temperature of the fish tank, instead of 76 degrees, it's at 70 degrees. So that's how far we are right now, six, six degrees away. We want the integral error. How much has the system strayed from the set point since we began this controller? So this is a sum of small errors in theory. Then we want the derivative, how quickly is the system straying from the set point right now? Now this sounds real fancy schmancy, but we'll understand this a lot easier if we think about how it was designed. As I told you, it was originally designed for autopilots, specifically for the autopilots on Navy ships. But let's pretend that instead of a Navy ship, we're just driving a car. Now while you drive, if you need to make a right turn, your intended path, in other words, I need to go to the right, is very different from your current path. Why? Because you haven't started turning right yet. So you turn the wheel in a matter proportional to the turn. A sharp turn gives you, in other words, you need a big change in direction, so you do a lot of movement to the steering wheel. If it's just a slight turn, that's a small change in direction, you do a smaller movement of the steering wheel. Okay, now instead of the right turn situation, now you're on a straight highway. You're at a constant course and speed, but 
there's always small inaccuracies because none of us are perfect. So every once in a while we have to make little small adjustments to the steering wheel as the errors add up, okay? Because maybe the maybe the road points directly east, but you have your steering wheel set and you're actually traveling at east plus one degree. Well, eventually that's going to sort of stray you off to the side of the lane and then you move the steering wheel just a little bit and you come back to the center of the lane and so on and so on. The third type of error is you're on a bridge now, again on your straight highway, and you suddenly get hit by a giant gust of wind when you're on top of the bridge. Well, your intended and your current path are very, very similar, but there is a sudden rate of change. The wind has jerked the vehicle. Maybe it's only changed the vehicle by a degree, but it did it incredibly quickly, right? So what do you do? Well, you quickly correct with the steering wheel before you're driving off the bridge. So you sort of anticipate what's going to happen because you see how quickly things are changing. Those three types of errors, the first one is the proportional. We need to turn the car right now because there's a right turn coming up. The second type of correction, these are your small incremental errors because us humans aren't perfect while we're driving. That's your integral type error and correction. It slowly adds up. The little error slowly adds up and next thing you know, your tire's on the side of the road and you need to scoot over a little bit. The third type of correction is when that gust of wind suddenly pushes the car or the ship and you don't want to drive off the bridge so you jerk the steering wheel and that is called the derivative type error and correction. And you're like, oh wow, this is all very fun, but who in the heck uses this? Well, that's a darn good question. Who uses PID? Well, it's used extensively in controlling machines of all types. In fact, the heater of my fish tank is exactly like that. It's a PID. In your car, your cruise control, your idle speed controller, your coolant temperature, your oil pressure, fuel pressure, your ABS, your suspension systems, all work with PID controllers. Ovens, stoves, microwaves, heaters, computer fans, 3D printer heads, um, rotating machinery, all kinds of medical devices. Now, some of these will implement PID using analog means, for example, a pressure regulator valve on your hot water tank in your house uses a diaphragm and a spring, and although we don't want to get into physics here, the diaphragm works with the integral and the proportional aspect, and the spring works with the derivative aspect of the errors, and sure enough, it's a PID controller. So, PID regulation is performed because of the nature of all of these devices. We don't want the cruise control to go from 60 miles an hour to 80 miles an hour. No, we want the cruise control to stay precisely at, say, 70. So that's why we use PID. Okay, so how do we use this thing? Or how do we do it? Okay, let's look again at that block diagram. And here's, we're going to just walk through with words what happens. You take a measurement. So if I was driving a car, I'd say, okay, I'm supposed to be going, say, east. How is my car pointed right now? And maybe it's pointed at 91 degrees instead of 90. So we compare that with the desired set point. That's the proportional error. We calculate the rate of change. Hey, last time I looked, was I headed this way? If you had that gust of wind, the answer is going to be no. And then you also sum the error to your cumulative, cumulative error. So again, we are supposed to be going east. That's 90 degrees. We're actually at 91 degrees. That one degree error gets summed 
as we're talking about here. Then we use the error calculation to move the output up or down. In other words, we want to move the steering wheel to the left or to the right. We set a new output level, and then we wait a predetermined amount of time for the change to take effect. Because obviously nothing happens instantly. And then we repeat this forever and ever and ever. Whole books are written on PID controllers and the very fine art of tuning them. They can be too fast, they can be too slow, neither one of those is great. They can have huge swings until the system actually gets on track. They can be difficult to tune because a lot of things change slowly. For example, the temperature of my aquarium does not go up and down on a moment's notice. So, in the example that we created with the pressure cooker, I made it so that the heat up and the cool down is extremely, extremely fast. So, this hardware, this hardware module that I created is a, for a hypothetical pressure cooker pot that has a really, 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 really strong heater, making it heat up really quickly, and almost no thermal insulation, which is why it cools down so quick. So this will be quite a workout for the PID class that I want you to write. It probably will never find the perfect power level. Why? Because in real life you would have some insulation and you wouldn't have such a giant heater. And it's not important because the important thing is the actual temperature inside the pressure cooker. Okay? So, let's look at these three constants that we're going to need. We're going to need Kp, Ki, and Kd. And again, I want you to look at the diagrams. And these are constants, and we're going to use these constants to multiply them against the proportional, the integral, and the derivative error. We're going to use these constants to fine-tune the response. Now, think back about when you were learning to drive. You know, there you are, you're 15, trying to get your learner's permit. And each time that you turn the wheel to change lanes, you probably overcompensated you probably steered in a jerky motion and from a moment to the next you found yourself with the tires rubbing the white lane and you're like oh crap and then you oversteered and <coughs> now your left tires were on the right lane and so on and so uh, on the left lane on the white lane and so on and so forth so your kp was way too large because as soon as you noticed an error you overreacted and your KI and your KD were too small. Why? Because you let these things happen before you reacted. Well, that makes sense. You weren't really tuned to feel the <coughs> small changes in direction as you, you know, spend years and years driving. So you only move the wheel when you saw a large change in direction. Well, that same thing happens when you have rookie helmsmen on Navy ships. Everyone that's trying to fall asleep knows that the new guy is on duty because you keep getting jerked around in your, in your rack. And the next thing you know, you're bouncing your head against the left side of the rack. The next thing you know, your head's on the right side of the rack. And it just goes back and forth. Because, yes, there are autopilots on Navy ships. But in order to keep everybody um, practiced, everybody has to drive. And... Especially the new guys. They really make you lose a lot of sleep. So, now that you have a PID controller, so what? When can I use it? Well, I could use it for a self-stabilizing plane rudder control system. Why not? I've flown planes with exactly such a thing. Or a fancy temperature control system for your aquarium. Doesn't even have to be that fancy. Mine only costs like $35. Cruise control system for the new car company you're creating. Or maybe you work for a car company. Airflow control system for your greenhouse, a self-driving model airplane or rocket, humidity and temperature control for your humidor, and so on and so on. How about an incubator? You want to really shock it? You want to go nuts and really, I mean, things that just don't make any sense? An ostrich egg incubator with computer control will start around $5,000, and it's really just an oven. The picture here is for a chicken egg incubator and because it has computer control using PID it costs $850 and yes it's a chicken egg incubator 
So, could you create something like this? Absolutely. With the two controllers that we have covered, you will be able to write for most of the control situations that you will ever, ever, ever be faced with. Okay, here's another way to look at KP, KI, and KD. KP is used against the question of where is the system now as opposed to where should it be? So in the pressure pot, in the pressure cooker, it's a temperature setting versus the temperature now. So if this number is greater than zero, well, we're underpowered. So we need to increase the power. <coughs> well, how much? Well, KP times delta T. That's how much. If the system is off by one degree of temperature and we guess we need 5% more power, we use a KP equal to 5. KI is used against the small inaccuracies that add up over time. So maybe the PID has the power set at 15.4, but really, really, really it should be 15.8. Well, the system will ever, ever so slowly cool down. So each time that you go through the loop, take temperature setting minus temperature now, in other words, the error, and multiply by your constant, Ki, and we're going to simply add that each and every time. So Ki times the error, and we just add it continuously adding. That is what an integral is, right? It's a sum of small things. And similarly for Kd. Kd is the instantaneous rate of change. So you take the error right now versus the error a second ago, and it tells you how quickly the temperature is changing. So if we were to put the pressure cooker outside in the South Pole, it would cool down a whole lot faster than if we took that same pressure cooker and put it outside in Death Valley. Here's some hints. An outline of your class should look like what you see there. Note how private methods, methods that are not meant to be used by the public, in Python nomenclature we normally start it with a single underscore. The other methods we inherit from the base class that we wrote previously. So here's a sample method for calculating proportional. Self KP times set point minus the new reading. Super super. Then, since you need to bracket the output between 0 and 100, remember that little trick we talked about? Min, max. So min 100 of max 0, blah, blah, blah. Well, that'll help you make sure that the output is never more than 100% or never less than 0%. And pressure cooker PID is, of course, in the shared folder. This is an example of the kind of performance that you would expect to see with all of the sample files. Notice that our desired temperature stays within a tenth of a degree of our desired set point. Okay? And notice how the hardware module is constantly making us change the power level. Why? Because that's real life. In real life, the thermometer is going to be a little jittery. You're not going to get two exactly the same readings from one point to the next. And the simulated heating element, it's going to vary depending on whether or not your neighbor turned on his air conditioner. However, the controller manages to maintain the output steady even though I've built in all these hazards. And both controllers, the PID controller and the on-off controller, because Python is so effective, is less than a hundred lines of code. Again, I invite you to look at the shared folder to see all of these things. Hope that was enjoyable. I'll see you in the next course, 22. Have a great time with this, really. PID is very interesting.